this mean? Yeah. Um, so, we have a solution. And that's what I'm here to talk about. We have passed a school year budget that, has, that shrinks that budget deficit down to about $24,000 uh, in, in the coming year. We have an opportunity to shrink that even more by simply getting four more students than we anticipate getting. We have, and we didn't do a pie in the sky uh, jump in students. We just kind of did the natural flow of hiring more students for the chance to come in. And if we just get 
or more than that, we can actually get down to the black. So, but there is a, there is a catch, and this is where you guys come in. So, what is the problem? So I'll just the problem. The solution is that we're going to increase our tuition without losing the number of kids. So we're going to simultaneously increase the number of kids, which increases income, and increase the tuition. Now, the, the risk in that is how do you increase that tuition without driving parents away? And this is why I'm here. We don't, we don't drive parents away by, by we provide a scholastic account, uh, a grant account that can help cover some of the gaps that they can't afford or that LSGO doesn't pay for. And some of those gaps are going to be very small, some of these gaps will be a bit moderate, but there will be a gap. And some parents will say, God, I don't want to do that, I can't pay for that. And we can say, yes, you can, we can help, and we get to keep the thing here. Not only here for us, but here for the children so that they can receive a Christian education in this world. So, how do we do that? When I say the word taxes, I'm going to lose half the room. <laughs> the donation, I'm going to lose the other half of the room. So I'm going to try very hard to avoid both of those terms. We can do that by redirecting the money that we already owe the state of Ohio, that we're already paying the state of Ohio. We're going to redirect it to the Bethlehem families. And when they apply for it, they will redirect it to the Bethlehem school. And that will help keep us all. So, next slide. The Lutheran Scholastic Grant organization, LSGO. The LSGO uh, was presented here about this time last year, and I sat in where you were sitting and said, that sounds like a great idea, and then I immediately forgot it, because it's, I'm going to do that later when I get home. I took the flyer, and then that was the last thing that came in my head, because at the time, in my head, it was, wouldn't it be nice if we could help the school families? That would be amazing. But here's what I'm saying. We need those school families' help so that we can have a secure school. Like the one, they are now equating. That is the bulk of our strategy, our financial strategy. If we can help these families with the tuition that more reflects the cost of, a, of a, a educating a student, then we can actually continue our mission and help our families. And here's the important part it doesn't cost you an extra dime. It doesn't cost you an extra dime, but it will cost you about five minutes of your time and just a little bit of planning. So, this chart right here is blown up over by the coffee. Every time you got coffee for the last several weeks, you will see that chart. If you come in through the front door, there's a big chart right inside the big wooden doors. If you only come in through the school doors, there's a chart out by the school. There are flyers over there, and I have flyers here to pass out. Now, what does this say? This basically outlines exactly how easy it is to redirect your Ohio State dollars. By using the little barcode with your phone, it immediately pulls up the website. You don't want to use your smartphone, you can go directly to the website. The, the question that we'll say <coughs> is, basically, how much can you donate? Now, if you did your taxes last year, if you look online, oh, you can't read that at all. <laughs> now to get our time. Um, on line 13 of your 2022 taxes, we'll say how much you paid last year, or how much you owed, and how much the Ohio, state of Ohio says we're going to need that money. So in most cases, it is well above the maximum. But if you have an income that's, very, that's, that's not very big, they're not going to they take too much, but you're still going to say how much is owed. The maximum amount of donation that is uh, uh, used as a tax deduction, or tax credit rather, a tax credit, is $750 per individual or $1,500 per joint uh, couple. So, um, in terms of how much can I donate and still get that dollar for dollar tax credit, it is, you'll, you'll find that on line 13. What is the line where you actually say, here's what I gave to the LSGO? It's actually on line, it's on line 22 of your um, tax credit form. When you, when you say, did you make any deductions to a, to a scholastic grant for a non-chartered, non-public school? That's line 2022. So 22, that line, takes directly off of 13. 
So, I've already lost about half of you. <laughs> Here's where um, the easy button is. Okay, thank you. Here's where the easy button is. If you donate $10, you get a $10 off of your tax, uh, you get a $10 tax credit. If you donate 100, you get 100 dollars. If you were, if you owe money at the end of the year, you're going to owe less money. If you were going to get a return, you're going to get a bigger return. So whatever dollar you give, that's the dollar you're going to get back by paying less or getting it in your tax return. And you say, well, Bill, I don't have seven hundred fifty dollars sitting around here, and that's okay because you can give all the way up to April fifteenth uh, and credit it to your 2023 taxes. So you can actually give it in March or whenever you're doing taxes, and then you can turn around and get your tax refund. So I, I'm not telling you how to work the finances, I'm just saying that it can be done. And throughout the course of the next year, if you don't want to have a large sum of money to give, you can actually give a little bit <laughs> every month. On a scheduled pattern, adds up to 750 or 1500 however you want to do it, and then you can get all that back in the year. So, in brief, if you go to taxes, check line 13. When you give that, when you do that donation, you get the receipt, and it goes on line 2022. When you donate to the LSGO, when you pop in there, it's going to say, "Hey, do you have a particular school that you want to target this money to?" Because you can donate to just all general Lutheran schools; anyone can, or you can target to that Lutheran school. And then, when you do your taxes, you get that dollar for dollar back. Now. We are going to need, we have right now $17,500 in, in our account that we know. Of. We know with certainty at least seven more donors have already given, probably more. So it's probably closer to about 22, 23, and 24,000 right now. We probably need, if we're fully going to fund and help all these parents and our preschool, we'll probably need about 38,000 a year. Now, what does that mean? That means if 10 more couples, Luther question. <laughs> if 10 more couples gave the maximum amount, we're there. If 20 individuals did it, we're there. If 30 people did less than that, then we're there. Now, who are these people? We're, we're doing a campaign that starts here. It's already going on with our school families. Good. It's, we have school parents. We have school grandparents. We have friends. People who don't necessarily like to pay taxes, anyone can do this. <laughs> It's, it's not about taxes, it's about redirecting how your tax money goes. And it literally takes five minutes. So, I'm asking everyone, um, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to give this presentation again in January. I'm going to give it again in February. I might just touch on it in March, because what I did last year was I said, that's a great idea, I'm going to totally do that. And then it never came up again. Yeah. And so... Um, I, I, people like me, procrastinators, I don't know, you might have a couple in the bunch, are going to need just a couple of reminders. And these big posters are going to stay up forever. And if you don't pick up the flyer or you don't have it at home, you can just do a, a barcode on that thing, save it as the papers tab, and it's on your phone. It's on your, your laptop, whatever. So, um, wait, wait, I'm going to take a question here in a second. Um, that's it. Sue, you got a question? I did not. Okay. Thank you. It's also going to be January start. So how is it different? Like which families are going to be benefiting from this? Who might not benefit from that choice, or are they the same families living in this? So Ed Choice is uh, comes through the state of Ohio, and it is also income based, and so. It, that goes on a percentage of uh, percentage of poverty level that you can get fully funded. Right up to four hundred percent of poverty. Level. Yeah. It was, it's full coverage. The minute Taylor saw that, so LSGO is similar. I don't know if it tracks exactly the same, but it's going to say that you're going to have a maximum donation based on your income, um, and and it's going to be able, they're going to say how much you can. I was just wondering about families who maybe don't qualify for a choice, but they see it as tuition increase. Is this something, it doesn't sound like it would be something that would necessarily impact those particular families, that it would be specifically to the ones that... So, 
This is where I'm going to, I do, I don't know, like if you make a bunch of money, I don't know if they're going to say this is not your program. I've not actually done this. Scott, can you help with this? Yeah, so you can apply for Ed Choice, uh, and you can get a little bit amount of money, even if you make like a million dollars a year, you can get up to $616 a year off, off your, as, as a qualified scholarship. So there's where that's going. Um, what, what we're saying is in the, in the past, we have had our tuition level set at the full Ed Choice scholarship. What we're saying now is our tuition is going to be above what the Ed Choice scholarship is going to be. So this is going to be a way that we can kind of bridge that gap of what we're charging in tuition and what Ed Choice is going to cover if a family gets 100% of the Ed Choice scholarship. Yes. Or even if they get less. There's going to be a bigger gap if they get less. And That's we, right. And we can help try to bridge that. Big there, gap. Is, there is a whole spreadsheet of if you make, it goes up to 450% of poverty, you, you qualify for a full scholarship. If you make 451%, you qualify for X dollar amount. If you make 452%, you qualify for X dollar amount. So that goes all the way up to 785% of poverty, and then you kind of cap out at that point. Okay. Uh, Art, you got a question? I'll come back to you. I think it's important to say, if some people are thinking, why are we charging more than the Ed Choice? It's because the actual cost of yes. educating the child is greater than that. And so we need to fill, mind the gap. It's greater than that by a The gap is what we're trying to fill. So even, even, our, even our tuition raise is not really the, the, the full cost of our tuition. Now we can bring that cost per student down by keeping more students in the building. And that lowers mm -hmm. the per student cost. Do you have a question? My understanding is that anyone can apply to this. Yes. And that it doesn't matter if you are poor or rich, you can apply for this yes. and still still get some of it. Yes. So it has it's not even though it's income based, it doesn't mean that just because you have a lot of money you can't take advantage of this. That's correct. But you can only do how much is in there. And so a healthy scholastic grant fund is going to help keep in school, and especially our school, is solvent in terms of both uh, financial responsibilities as well as how we can help the, the school families that really want to get to the Okay. Um, I don't take too much more time. Um, so if there's any questions, there's a big poster back here. I'm going to be in the back. You can see Michelle. You can see Scott. Um, do we have time for do you want to do it, or could we wait another time? Doesn't matter. We'll, we'll do it next okay. time. Okay. We'll do it. So we're gonna we're gonna follow up on this one. But one more thing is that there is a the script program, the raise right program. I just wanted to say we have only gotten about seven hundred fifty dollars for the course of the year. This is one more opportunity of redirecting our shopping dollars into help the school. And so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that another time. All right. I'm giving you more. All right. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill. A round of applause, literally. All right. Yeah, I do want to say that, uh, let say thank you uh, to the congregation as a whole for, you know, uh, asking good questions, raising good concerns, and also to Bill Fry and many other people that got together in a, in a group, in a committee, and started hashing out what would be the best financial solution uh, to provide for a sustainable, uh, you know, finances for our, our school. And uh, their, their hard work is starting to pay off. And the hard conversations and questions are starting to pay dividends. So again, I want to say thank you to all you know who have asked, raised uh, good questions, hard questions, who have raised concerns, good, hard concerns, but have also have been part of the solution. Uh, thank you, thank you, and thank you. All right, here we.
we go. Ignatius of Antioch. Here we go. Let's do from beginning, or not from beginning. Ta da! There we are. All right. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 to 11, a little bit, and then uh, into Ignatius of Antioch, pastor and martyr. Um, um, this, uh, uh, the information I have on Ignatius is a little light, so it's okay that we spent a little bit of time uh, with uh, Mr. Fry this morning. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God, we praise your name for Ignatius of Antioch, pastor and martyr. He offered himself as grain to be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts, so that he might present to you the pure bread of sacrifice. Accept the willing tribute of all that we are and all that we have, and give us a portion in the pure and unspotted offering of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So I really want to focus in on Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. And uh, again, kind of focusing on the word martyr and where it comes from, uh, and because that's who Ignatius of Antioch is, he's a pastor and martyr, and uh, one of the first well-known martyrs uh, outside of uh, biblical times. So, Revelation, chapter 6. Okay. So, some possible three theme verses for all of Revelation. Uh, these are probably my top three. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Okay? This is really important stuff. So much that God's going to attach a blessing to those who read it, a blessing to those who hear it, and who keep it. Uh, or the words of Jesus from Revelation chapter 2, which is a very common confirmation verse. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Another good way of kind of seeing Revelation as a whole. Or maybe the very end, uh, where it says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And so uh, these are really good Bible verses that really kind of just give you the big picture of, you know, what Revelation is trying to, what God is accomplishing, and what he is communicating to us uh, through this book. Okay? So let's go to a little bit uh, more hone in on the context. Okay, so chapters 2 to 3, uh, Jesus has a personal message to seven different churches that are scattered throughout Asia, Asia Minor. Right? Um, so yeah, so it says Philadelphia. It is not the United States. Right? It's a town called Philadelphia in Asia Minor. Okay? Um, chapters 4 and 5 then turn to a vision of heaven. Uh, in that, you know, when Jesus ascended into heaven and when he was coronated and, and, and to the throne uh, in heaven, uh, that's, that's what we see and hear in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And then... Chapter 6 through the beginning of chapter 8, we get a picture of the end times. The time between Jesus' ascension and the final judgment. So all the things that are going on here are during that time. Which means, guess when these things are going on? Yeah. Right now. Right now. Right? So, and, and the way uh, chapter 6 through 8 pictures it is the opening of seven seals. Okay? So... Uh, holding in just a little bit more. Now we're to chapter 6. Four seals have been opened. And of course, uh, for those of you who are Notre Dame fans and history, history fans, right? The four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? This is from Revelation chapter 6, right? Not from college football, right? But yet the, the, the horsemen with a crown, with a sword, with scales, and with death. And uh, that's the uh, first four seals that are opened. Then we got the fifth seal, which is the uh, passage that we're going to cover today. Afterwards, you'll have a sixth seal, uh, terrestrial upheavals and celestial disturbances. Uh, and then a nice little interlude uh, in chapter 7 before the uh, opening of the seventh seal. So, we are going to focus today on the fifth seal. Chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Uh, can somebody read? Uh, Revelation chapter 6, uh, 9 through 11. And then we're going to hone in on verse 9. 
And he opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were killed as they themselves had been. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Okay, a little <clears throat> note here. This is the only seal that actually doesn't literally bring strife upon the earth. Like, all the other ones are like, all these things are happening. It's like, ooh, 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 ooh. And this one, while it still is sad, right, there, there is distress. Like, this one actually doesn't heap more distress upon the earth. Okay? Uh, just uh, thought that was very interesting. Um, what images come to mind with the phrase the altar? Right? Why, why or what's so important about the souls of those who have been slain? Under the altar, right? crying from the altar. Like what, what, what comes to mind when we think of the altar? Sacrifices. Right? A holy place. Right? Yeah, those are probably the top two things, right? In the Old Testament, right? The altar was a place of sacrifice, right? Uh, you know, uh, animals were literally slain, right? And then literally burned whole on the altar, right? Yeah. Is it, it's just from under the altar. I'm assuming, like, the earth opening up and it's the cry of the martyrs. Yeah, could be. Or it could be like, you know, I mean, you could almost get a really graphic picture of, you know, like when you grill something, what's underneath the grill? Oh, ashes, right? You know, and, and almost have a picture of like, they have been destroyed for the witness of the Lord, right? And here are their remains. Yeah. The altar is also supposed to be a place of sanctuary. Okay, there's also a, 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 a picture of sanctuary, right? You know, uh, that's what it means, right? We still use that phrase every once in a while, right? To take sanctuary, to take refuge, right? That uh, certain people, when they were about to be murdered, would literally go to the altar and claim sanctuary, right? Because it's a holy place, it is a special place, it is reserved for sacrifices unto the Lord, right? And if someone is about to be murdered, right, that is not a sacrifice unto the Lord, right? Especially if it's, you know, un in for unholy means. But here, it is, right? Here, it's like, this was for unholy purposes and intent of God's enemies, but there is something holy about it. <coughs> the souls. Yeah. There may be ashes, but there's still a soul. But they still have a soul. And they're still crying out. Right. We'll get to that one in a minute. All right. Um, what does it say about those who are slain for the word of God? Slain for the word of God. Any images come to mind? Thoughts? For the word of God. All of the apostles. Yeah. There are a lot of people who have been, right? And it mentions, right, in verse 11, that the number needs to be fulfilled, right? Or that the number would be fulfilled of those who were slain for the word of God, right? But again, you have that picture of preparing a sacrifice, or right, even in the Old Testament, <coughs> that they were slain. They were slain. There are people still being. Yeah. Right, and there still are, right? Because again, the time frame of the seals, right, is right now, uh, from Christ's ascension until His coming to judge the living and the dead, right? So we are living in this time, right now, right? Um, another thought would be, you know, you think of like a sacrifice given. Uh, maybe uh, sometimes we talk about an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Right, you know, and you know, someone who is slain for the word of God, the number one answer should be 
Christ, right? Christ himself, right? That Jesus was slain for the word of God, right? He bore testimony to the truth. And what happened to him? He was crucified. He was murdered. He was slain. Uh, not burned on an altar, but on the cross, right? Which, again, because of his sacrifice, he was holy, right? Because of his sacrifice, because of who he is, right? It is a holy place, right? It is a place of refuge. The cross is a place of refuge for us, right? Good. Um, slain is also used in other passages. I'm going to keep moving on this one, but, you know, it's interesting in chapter 5, right? We sing this in, uh, uh, in This is the Feast, right? How is the Lamb described in heaven? As one who has been slain, right? Worthy is the Lamb who has been slain. Right? Again, the uh, connection between the martyrs and Jesus himself. All right, so what's the given reason for why people are, why these people were slain? Like, what does your Bible say in verse 9? Why were they killed? Testimony of what? Testimony of the word of God. Uh, any other translations that your Bible uses? I think uh, ESV says, the witness they had borne. Okay? Any other Bible translations? Verse 9. Testimony which they held. Testimony which they held. Okay? Like they're holding on to it, and they are not going to let it go. Right? Which is, you know, so born means to carry. Right? You know, and so, you know, those are both good, <coughs> similar images, you know, uh, given there. Any other translations we have in verse 9 as to why they were slain? Testimony which they had made. Okay, maintained. So the testimony they have maintained, right? Again, very similar image, right? They are not going to let go of this. They are not going to let They're going to hold on to this. And they're going to give this testimony, right? And not shove it away. But they're going to maintain it. Even if it means that they are killed for it. All right. The Greek word for witness is martis, which is also where we get the English word martyr. Okay? All right, so uh, the definition of martyr or witness, and I will say that this slide is basically saying it kind of morphed into the technical term that we have today. So in New Testament times, the apostles were Jesus' witnesses to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, just as Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, right? They were to bear testimony. They preached, they taught, they baptized, right? They testified to Jesus' death and resurrection in public, and if they were arrested, they would also testify to Jesus' death and resurrection in court before judges, before kings, before governors, right? And because of that, that's that witness, right? They were martyrs, right? Uh, they officially declared repentance and the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus, wherever they went. So the apostles kind of got this witness known and, and, and public, right? And that's really, if you hone in on witness, that's what this word means. Um, and then all Christians are also called to be Jesus' witnesses with their words and with their actions, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, one of the key themes of 1 John, right, is that we bear witness to Jesus and his death and resurrection, uh, and that he is our Lord and Savior by our love for one another. That when we love one another as God has loved us, we are bearing witness to Jesus, right? Or in our patient endurance while suffering for the name of Jesus, and this comes from 1 Peter, right? You know, that we are witnesses, we are martyrs uh, for Jesus, whether or not, whether we're killed or not. Right? We bear witness, we suffer, we patiently endure, and we show love for one another. When we do these things, we are bearing witness to Jesus. Okay? We are martyrs. However, by the end of the first century, martyr became a technical term uh, to describe someone who was murdered because he or she bore testimony to Jesus. And we actually get one example, yeah. 90 A.D., 
uh, give or take, when Revelation was written, uh, Jesus mentions it in Revelation 2, verse 13. Okay, we have an example of the word martyr being used as someone who was killed for the faith. Okay? Um, other words and phrases uh, for Christians who were killed for bearing testimony to Jesus. Sometimes the early church would call it their exodus or their exit or departure, uh, just as it's used in Luke chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 31, or sorry, Luke 9, 31, uh, where Jesus is talking with Moses and Elijah up on the Mount of Transfiguration, talking about the exodus that he was about to undergo, <coughs> talking about his way to death on the cross. Okay, so it's, again, a, a connection to Jesus, and some people use that term. Uh, again, they would use the word slain, murder, or sacrifice. And then another one that kind of came out uh, in a generation or two afterwards uh, was the phrase, given a heavenly birthday. Uh, we don't use that too much in our circles, but there are some Christian circles that will still use the phrase, their heavenly birthday. And many saints' days are celebrated on the day when they were martyred, or at least the best guess of the day on which they were killed for the testimony of the Lord. For St. Valentine's. Yeah. Why well, was that? that? That date was not when he died. It was when he was born. Again, sometimes they do it when he's born, and sometimes they just don't know, so they just pick a date. Uh, but if they do know, or tradition says, you know, they died on this date, a lot of saints' days are connected to when they were martyred. All right? So let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. How about verse 10? Okay? How is God described in verse 10? <clears throat> How is God described in verse 10? Well, that's an interesting description. <laughs> <laughs> Holy and true. Holy and true. Wow. Any other uh, translations? Holy and true. Sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord. Despot. Despot. He's a despot. That's the Greek word. Right. He is all knowing and all controlling, all powerful, all ruling. Right? That's kind of the, the phrase. Right? He is in charge of all. He's the judge. He's the judge. Yeah. What's important about these qualities of God? We're, we're, we're talking about martyrdom. Right? We're talking about people who are slain for bearing witness to God. He's worthy of it. Okay, God's worthy. Right? He's worthy of this sacrifice. It's worth it to give one's life because he is holy. holy. Because true. he is true. Because he is sovereign. Right? Any other uh, things about these qualities of God that are so important when we talk about martyrdom? Like, why is it important that God is holy and true? He's still in control. Yeah. When it seems like the world is coming out of control, when it seems like God's enemies are starting to go out of control, we always remember that God is in control. Amen. Right? We always remember that God is in control. And the saints who are under the altar, right, the martyrs who are under the altar, are reminding us of that fact. God is still holy. God is still true. And God is still sovereign. It's not just random. It's not random. Right? This is not just random chance. Right? This is the will of God. And we do need to be reminded of that. Yeah. I think I like true as well. Yeah. All right. You want to speak on truth or another way? Okay. And if we suppose that these seals are ha have been happening for the past two thousand years, which mm -hmm. we've been in the end time for two thousand some years, mm -hmm. right? Then the cry of the martyrs, as you were saying, like the, he's still sovereign. Yeah. So maybe in, in looking at all of these horrible things that are happening, and this one is not necessarily horrible to the earth, mm -hmm. we can look at it and say, they're crying out, the Lord is still sovereign. The Lord, they're they're mm -hmm. calling out to him to say, how much longer, just to, you know, as a reminder to us, mm -hmm. you know, we've been waiting for 2,000 some years. Are we there yet? The time <laughs> the day, yeah. you know? Are we there yet? And the answer is... Not yet. Yet. Not yet. Not yet. Right? Yeah, and that kind of gets your, your comment also gets to the second question, right? How would you paraphrase or explain what are they crying for? What what are they trying to say in verse 10? What are they asking God for? Justice. Justice. Is it okay to ask God for justice? 
Yeah. I mean, um, I referenced Genesis 4, verse 10. If anyone's really quick on their uh, uh, device or page. Uh, but he is the judge, right? So does anyone know what Genesis 4, 10 is referring to? Crying out for justice. Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Right? Cain and Abel. Right? Abel's blood is crying out to who? To God for vengeance. Right? Abel's blood is crying out to God for vengeance. Right? And, and, and so you, all, you have like a similar picture of those who are martyred for the testimony of Jesus. They are also, their blood, right, it, their souls are still crying out for justice. Right? Um, I also like Romans 12, 19. Uh, that's also another really good Bible passage. Romans 12, 19. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, declares the Lord. Right? Do not avenge yourselves, but leave it to God. Right? Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. I will repay. So again, it's that word of trust in God. Right? That God, you are sovereign. You are holy. You are true. We're still concerned about this, but we know that you're going to take care of this. You are going to avenge our blood, right? Uh, in the way you know best, right? And, and that's what that's what they cry out. Right? So, what's God's response? <coughs> Sit and wait. All right. So, uh, verse eleven. What's God's response to their cry? Rest for a little while. Okay? Be at peace. Rest. Alright? And what else? What else did he do? He gave him a white robe. Alright? White robe. Interesting. What's so important or significant about a white robe? Clean. Clean. Holy. Holy. Just like just like Christ, right? It's Christ's righteousness, right? Yeah. So, how is a white robe a gift of rest or refreshment or peace for the martyrs? You're not dealing with sin anymore. Okay. They're not dealing with sin. They have been sinned against and no more. Yeah. They can when be at peace. When the number's full, it's without spot. Yeah. Without spot, wrinkle, or stain, right? Washed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, right? And that gives them peace. Right? Just like that gives us peace. Even though we don't fully see it and realize it yet. Yeah? Here's a question. Do you know if this has anything to do with our tradition of the pastor wearing an alb and a stole? Because the word is stole in right. either one. Is there, you're the witness... Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I think just in wonder my training, if historically there's some connection. Yeah. In, in my training, I think they always go back to chapter 7, you know, with uh, where it gives a little more detail about the soul, you know, that uh, the foes gathered around, you know, uh, the throne, uh, have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, right? And they're in white robes, right? I think that's chapter 7 in Revelation. Uh, that's usually the, the image that comes to mind as opposed to chapter 6. But it does come up. It does come up. Oh, and what does uh, verse 11 imply? <clears throat> How long are they to rest? The number's complete and the martyrs being brought in. Which means, uh, what does that imply? <laughs> that there's going to be more martyrs to come. Right? Wow. There, there are more martyrs to come. There are more people who are going to be slain or murdered for the word and testimony of Christ. Right? But there will also be a limit. Right? There will be a limit. Right? There is a number. There's a limit. And then, boom. Uh, and if you don't believe in sovereign, you don't accept things like that. No. No. And, and, and especially as Americans, we really don't like sovereign. <laughs> we do. We do and we don't. <laughs> We're obsessed with it, but yet we don't get it. <laughs> right? So, or where do we find the peace? Right, where do we find peace? And it is in the grace of God. In through Jesus. Yeah, one comment then I'd like to move on to that. Okay. 
so basically, we're not all going to be martyred. We're all not going to live a horrible life of being, you know, what martyrs what live. Yeah, and Ignatius will touch on that a little bit. Okay. But, here's the point. Are you willing? Yeah. Yeah. Are you willing? You know, we, we say in the confirmation uh, address, Will you remain steadfast in this confession and church and suffer all, even death, then fall away from it? Yeah. And we say, yes, with, yes the, with the help of God. God, right? And I think a little reminder every once in a while might be good, because sometimes at like the first sign of conflict, you know, we kind of, you know, poo-poo <laughs> that uh, intent, or boredom, or distraction, or... Uh, or anything else that gets in the way, right? You know, it's like, wait a minute. Uh, no, we are to suffer all rather than fall away from this confession. Yeah. That's, that's why we, you know, we look back at the saints who have passed before, the martyrs specifically, mm -hmm. um, to give us encouragement yeah. so that we can stand. Right. We can stand, right? And God is still holy. He is still true. Right? And that's what matters. Right? So, connection to Ignatius, obviously, uh, he was martyred in Rome. Uh, the date, uh, we're not for certain the date, but the best guess is 17 October, 108 AD. And he would then join the ranks of those under the altar, crying out to God, how long? So, all right. Ignatius of Antioch, pastor and martyr. So, he was that generation right after the apostles. Probably born, you know, uh, about the same time when Jesus' public ministry began. Okay? You know, give or take. So sometimes those are called, like, the apostolic fathers uh, or the church fathers. You know, sometimes they get those kinds of uh, names and titles uh, thrown at them. This one is probably a little bit of a stretch, but it's interesting. Some suggest that Ignatius was one of the little children that Jesus took in his arms and blessed. Ooh, we can't prove it, but it cool. would be awesome if it was. Yes. Right? You know, it would be awesome. Uh, we do know that he was a disciple of St. John. So St. John was kind of his pastor for a, for a lot. Wow. So uh, he had a very good teacher. Uh, he was also given the name Theophorus or Theophorus, which means God-bearer, okay? And so we don't know if it was his parents who gave him that nickname, or whether St. John himself gave him that name, or by his parishioners, whom he served when he was their pastor, or when he was their bishop, right? We don't know who gave him that nickname, but it would be neat if we knew. Um, but, you know, in what ways are you called to be a God-bearer? Right. We carry the title Christian, and right, God's name matters, right? Because when we carry Christ's name, we carry Christ Himself, right? We carry the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We carry the very presence of God, right? Jesus, right? That's important, right? Just like Ignatius, right? God bearer. There you go. All right. Bishop of Antioch. So, uh, again, this is Antioch of Syria, which is modern-day Turkey. Uh, Antioch actually was a very well-established church. Uh, we know that uh, it was uh, very well-established uh, in Acts chapters 11 and 12. And there were Christians who were scattered during a persecution that arose over Stephen. Right? And so we do have clear... Uh, uh, testimony that, yeah, Antioch was a key factor in the early Christian church. And also, later on, would become kind of like a hub for sending missionaries out throughout the entire region. So Antioch was really important. Uh, first bishops of Antioch, St. Peter, Evodius, and then third one up, Ignatius. Hooray! All right. Persecution, though, uh, became... Uh, uh, started to arise. Uh, the emperor uh, of Rome, Trajan, uh, started persecuting Christians at the Council of Pliny, governor of Bithynia. <coughs> so, um, the main report that Pliny gave 
was, you know what, these Christians are meeting in private, they're exclusively monotheistic, unlike pretty much everybody else, uh, they're refusing to participate in public pagan religious observances, and because they're not going along with the uh, standard practices that everybody else is doing, we have some questions about who they are and what they do. Okay, um, they also heard that this Apostle Paul said, our citizenship is in heaven. And if you are from the outside, not knowing, and just naturally suspicious of a group that says our citizenship is in heaven, it has uh, plenty uh, reported that they hate the human race. Yeah. Or they hate the empire. So, there you go. Therefore, they ought to be punished. Because they hate human beings and they hate the empire. They sound terrible. They do sound terrible, right? Uh, and then, yes, practicing, his conclusion was practicing Christians should therefore be punished. So, Emperor Trajan said, okay, let's do it. <laughs> um, Ignatius was arrested for promoting Christianity, obviously, uh, and was transported from Antioch to Rome. However, this, you know, very similar to Paul's trip to Rome, that took a while. Right? Travel is not like easy and quick, right? It's up in stages, right? And and so um, as this trip would take a while, he was accompanied by fellow Christians and bishops, uh, including uh, what would become a really good friendship, Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. We covered Polycarp about a year ago. Yeah. Um, and what's really interesting is Ignatius wrote seven letters while under arrest and while he was traveling to Rome. So, you know that pattern, seven letters <laughs> to various churches, right? And that includes Ephesus, Magnesia, Trellis, Rome, Philadelphia, Smyrna. And then he also wrote one personal letter to Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. So, yeah, just interesting that, you know, uh, very similar patterns. Um, but these letters are really important. Some of them have been preserved. Uh, but besides the writings of a few church historians, uh, these letters are really the only source of information that we have on Ignatius. So, they like say, the, the information is a little scant. Um, but here are the key issues that Ignatius addressed. He, had a, he was dealing with Judaizers, uh, very similar to uh, the epistle of Galatians. All right, so, uh, there were groups of people within the church that were requiring all Christians to keep strict Jewish laws, such as worship on Saturday, or that you must have your, uh, your young uh, uh, male children circumcised, or if you're an adult convert, you must be circumcised, and then keep a kosher diet in order to be faithful to God. You know, and we have very similar themes to Acts chapter 15 and Galatians, and this issue was still a big deal a generation or two after uh, these groups just kept on pushing it. Uh, and then another issue that came up was something called docetism. That they basically taught that Jesus, the Son of God, is God, but only God. Like, he just seems to be a human being. He looked like a human being. He sounded like a human being, but really wasn't a true human being. Uh, and that teaching, that heresy, was promoted during this time uh, during Ignatius. So he will spend a lot of time on the letters emphasizing that Jesus truly is a human being just like you and me, right? That he uh, is the word made flesh and dwells among us, right? So yeah, docetism, it's really sad because they don't like Christmas. Right? They don't like the very themes of Advent and Christmas, right? You know, it's like, come on! Right? They don't like Easter either. They probably don't like Easter either, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so that's what Ignatius was dealing with uh, as a pastor. Um, the other thing is he gave a lot of counsel along the way. Uh, one of his big things is, for the sake of Christian unity, churches should submit in humility to their bishops, especially when they are orthodox, when they are teaching the truth of the faith. Submit to them with humility. Right? Follow along what they teach. Follow along what they preach. If they give you instruction, keep it. Right. Uh, that was Ignatius's counsel. Uh, really urged the churches to love one another. It sounds like John, right, in that regard. Right. Uh, just 
be fond of loving one another. And then the final point he made is that martyrdom is good. He said it is a death that is the fullest example of following Jesus. It's a death that bears witness to the Lord Jesus and his resurrection victory. And that is a death that should not be prevented when I arrive, dear Christians, in Rome. So he wrote ahead of time. Do not intervene. Let this be. Let God be sovereign. Let him be holy. Let him be true. If this is God's will that I give my life, so be it. Right? But do not intervene to try to save me. That's basically what he said. Yeah? What's really interesting it, to me is that as much as the government is not happy about these Christians who they can't really control, they're allowing them to write and communicate mm -hmm. as they're meandering toward Rome yep. to get crucified or what. Yeah, it is unique. It's just weird. It, it is weird. It's a little different to us, but that was the situation that they had and what they worked with and were able to utilize to make sure that the gospel was still proclaimed that faith was strengthened, right? I mean, the greatest letters in the New Testament are from Paul when he's on the road to being killed, right? And, 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 and the, the, the clear joy that he has in the Lord Jesus Christ and the care and love that he has for all these churches that drives him to write and that, you know, we still have those words of encouragement and hope even today, right? And, and Ignatius is kind of following in their train, right? You know, uh, sharing that word of God, sharing that encouragement, even though he is suffering for the sake of Christ. Or, you no, know, well, for, uh, you know, innocently suffering for Christ. Yeah, yeah one more comment, then we'll close up with him. I think something that's uh, really important to us in our age is this matter of unity in the relationship to the bishop. Mm -hmm. yeah. The bishop was the public confessor of the faith, and the congregation is viewed as like the instruments tuning to the, the confessor. Yeah. In other words, we echo you. Right. Yeah. And we don't, I mean, grass, I'm going to put you in the spot here. Mm -hmm. You are the public confessor. Yeah. And, and we are to be in tune with your public teaching. Right. And, and I think we also kind of make that even broader now, right? That's why we have a sin. That's why we walk together, right, in that confession, right? We walk together in this confession so that I am in tune with other brother pastors within the Missouri Synod. That's why, you know, this kind of goes to altered pulpit fellowship, right? Why we have calls and, and, and this structure, right? So that we are in tune with each other, right, and of course with the scriptures and the Lutheran confessions so that, you know, we are faithful, right, so that when you mirror my teaching, right, we are within unity of this confession and church, right. So it is nice to have a little extra guidance, right, uh, not on an island, right, and even the bishops back then were not on an island, right, they still gathered together for it for councils, especially uh, as the church and the state became, or as the state became, you know, Christian, uh, then uh, there was provision for that, uh, so that, uh, you know, bishops were not on an island by themselves. All right, I'd like to conclude with uh, hymn 661, The Son of God Goes Forth to War. Uh, this is a church militant hymn. Uh, it captures the martyrdom of Jesus, verse 1. Then it captures the martyrdom of Stephen, verse 2, the apostles, verse 3, and then anyone else, verse 4. We're just going to sing 1, 3, and 4, uh, but uh, as closing. So, bum, ba, da, dum, bum, da, bum, 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 bum. Okay, that's the new. Okay, here we go. The Son of God goes forth to war, a kingly crown to
Again, reminder, no Bible class uh, next Sunday and the Sunday after. We'll reconvene January 7th. We just have a few more saints to go. And then February-ish, uh, we'll begin with Bible study on Matthew. So, there we are. Bible study in Revelation chapter 6. And Ignatius of Antioch, pastor and martyr. Thanks for your time and attention. And thank you, Bill Fry, for also uh, sharing the uh, report with us today. And God bless to keep you. Amen.